today, you who may be watching today, may be streaming this message, this message goes to you. I'm grateful to give you this message because it comes out of my heart. God had this message on me for the last two or three weeks, and it's time that the Lord blessed me to give this to you. I'm grateful today that when the Lord gives me something, I'm grateful that the Lord blesses me to give this to you. For you especially who are watching, this goes to you. You are part of our family. If you want to give to our ministry, we have a giving site on myglasstidings.org. If you want to give, uh, we, would, we would covet your blessings and your, and, your generate, and, your, and your donations if you are blessed by this ministry. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to be in Numbers 21, 1 through 9. I want to give this message to you out of my heart. And, and sometimes this message is like this. We need to get out to people because huh, who knows that Jesus is coming soon? Come on, who really knows that Jesus is coming soon? He's coming soon and, and we have to be ready and we have to be receptive of his salvation. And this is one of those messages I want to speak on our salvation here. We'll be in Numbers 21, 1 through 9 here. And let you know, let you know, this Bible is so big and so vast that it has so many lessons in every book. And if we're not careful, we can sometimes take for granted the many treasures and concepts it holds for our salvation and our life in general. So many concepts, so many things in this book. This passage, is, to me, is one of those treasures. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. It says, the king of Arad, <clears throat> the Canaanite who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Athram. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So the Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was called Horamah. Then they journeyed from the Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the pe of people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. But we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on, the, on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Father, we thank you and honor you because of how great you are. And Lord, this message belongs to you. I don't preach in my own strength, Lord, but I preach in yours. Father, I thank you. I know, Lord, when... I preach messages like this. The enemy gets upset. But Father, I thank you that you give me power and give me strength to preach this message. I thank you, Father. I don't preach out of my own strength. I preach in yours. And Father, I give you thanks and praise. I pray that someone after this message will give their life over to you. And Father, I thank you that you can prick our hearts and minds. We give you praise in your holy name. Amen. In events of this passage, when it occurred, is very near of the Israel's 40-year journey in the wilderness. God delivered the children of Israel from Egypt 40 years earlier. 
And it took them two years to reach the Jordan River. And during that time, the Lord gave them his law and, and taught them about worshiping him. And when they arrived at Jordan, they, they refused to cross over the river into the promised land because of their lack of faith and rebellion against God. And because of that, the Lord sentenced the entire nation to wander in the wilderness until every member of that rebellious generation, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua, died. And it took 38 years for them to die. Now, during that 38-year period, God was faithful to the, walk, to the walk with Israel. In their walk, they were faithful. He was faithful to feed them and with manna every day to lead them from place to place and to protect them from their enemies. And God had been faithful to his people. The Israelites had grown sick and tired of wandering through the wilderness, we see here. They were tired of the Lord's plan. They were tired of manna. They were tired of their leader, Moses. And they were just sick and tired of everything. So in this text, we are told that they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. This is in verse 4. And the Israelites were forced to go this way because the Edomites would not grant them permission to cross their land. This forced Israel to walk through a terribly harsh desert that area was very, very, uh, uh, very, very harsh to walk through. It was mountainous, it was rough, and it was desolate. The people didn't like it. Verse 4 says, the soul of the people became discouraged on the way. The word discouraged meant that their tempers are short. They are frustrated and they are out of patience with the whole process of getting to Canaan. And so their frustration over the path they were being, they were, they were being forced to walk brought to the surface other complaints that they had in their hearts. In verse 5, they, they, their voice, they voiced several complaints. They complained that God and Moses brought them out of Egypt just to have them die in the wilderness. They complained about the lack of food. They complained about the lack of water. They complain about the manna God was sending them every day. And we know that manna, if you remember, was a miracle meal. It fell on the camp at night. Mm -hmm. It was plentiful and it was free. It was tasty and it was nutritious. It was a gracious gift from God to feed his hungry people. And the amount and quality of the, of the manna illustrates the grace, the power, and the genera generosity of our God. But despite God's grace in delivering them from Egypt, despite his generosity in feeding them, and despite his guidance in leading them, they begin to murmur and complain. They complain about the leader God gave them. And they also lodged their complaint against the Lord. In response to their complaints, God sent a judgment upon Israel in the form of fiery serpents. We're going to talk about that. Yet along with the punishment came the pardon. And this is the magnificent truth that I want you to see today. This passage is a harsh look at the consequences of sin. But it also illustrates the love and grace of God for the lost. This passage, though, is old and ancient, is a vivid illustration of what Jesus did for sinners on the cross. When speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus used this event as an illustration of his own death for sinners on the cross of Calvary. For Israel, this situation quickly degenerated into a hopeless situation. They were being bitten by vicious vipers, and many people were dying. There was no treatment for the snake bites. There was no escape from the snakes. They were trapped in hopeless circumstances from which they could not escape. I would like for us to consider the facts of yet another hopeless case here. 
This passage teaches us once again that there is hope for the hard cases. We will consider the incident of the vicious vipers here. And this passage will teach us there is hope for those trapped in a grip of sin. There is salvation for those who are perishing. And there is hope for the hopeless. If you're watching and listening today, be encouraged by this message today. In verses 4 and 5, first we see Israel's sin. Let me read that. It said, Then they journeyed in, uh, from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? But there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. See, in this event, Israel was guilty of several terrible sins against God. First, they rejected God's person. Verse 5 says, and the people spoke against God. Because they did this, the Lord judged him harshly. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get the idea here <laughs> that God is a little too sensitive. Don't think for a moment that the Lord is trigger happy and just waiting to judge the guilty and quick, too quickly and too harshly. The Lord does not wear his feelings on his shoulders, folks. One thing the people of Israel knew how to do, and they knew how to do it well, was to gripe and complain. They became the leading experts of griping and complaining. If you want to know how to gripe and complain, just ask an Israelite. This is about all they've done for 38 years. Just listen to the record of their worthless whining found in the book of Numbers. Uh, I was thinking of one verse in Numbers 11 and 1 says, And when the people complained, it pleased the Lord. Numbers 14 and 2 says, And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in his wilderness. Number 17 and 12 says, So the children of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, Surely we die. We perish. We all perish. So up until now, Israel had been guilty of speaking against their leaders. In this passage, we are told they spoke against God. Instead of talking about other people, they now turned their anger toward God. Can you imagine the audacity and the arrogance it took these trifling humans to speak against God? Before God chose them and before God saved them by his grace, they were nobodies. They were nothing but common slaves in the land of Egypt. Now they dare to speak against God. They rejected the Lord's promises we see here. Here's what they said to God. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt in this wilderness? God had promised the nation of Israel that he would bring them into the promised land. They had his word on it, and yet they looked God straight in the eye and said it in a brazenly, arrogantly, and irreverently way. We don't believe you. In, in effect, they called God. God a liar. I sure wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I want you to remember this. Every time you doubt the word of God, you discredit the word of God. Remember what Paul said, and I said this last week, let God be true, but every man a liar. That's Romans 3 and 4. So just so you know, the Lord holds his word in high esteem. The psalmist said in Psalms 138 and 2, he says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. He expects us to read, honor, and obey and make his word the standard of our lives. And then they rejected the Lord's provision. To add insult to injury, they said, For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worst, worthless bread. 
Some of you hadn't really read that. I want you to read that sometime. It said, for there was no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Listen, folks, God provided them with bread every day. And when they needed water, he gave it to them. They lied. And they did not appreciate the things that they had received from the hand of the Lord. That's why I say, folks, don't take for granted what God gives us. Amen? amen? amen. Come on, someone say amen here. Amen. Two words in this verse are worth noting. The word loaves means to be disgusted by. God graciously gave them the manna from heaven every day. He used it to keep them fed and healthy. Yet they looked at God's gracious provision and they said, this stuff is disgusting. And then they said the word worthless. Oh, that was a, that's a bad word here. They said the manna was worthless. Manna was far from worthless. While they were in the wilderness, this bread was not only their strength and their nourishment, it was their very salvation. It kept them alive. Without it, they would have starved to death. Yet the one thing that gave them life, they renounced. And then they rejected the Lord's prophet. Not only did they speak against the Lord, they spoke against Moses. You know what? If a man rejects God, he will reject God's man. And if he fall out with God, you will eventually fall out with the man of God. And they did. Listen. If you're going to live for God, the world is going to turn on you. People are going to reject you. If you love Jesus, folks, and you live for Jesus, you will be loathed by the world. The Lord Jesus himself said in John 15, 18 through 19, it says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Right. And Paul asked this truth too. Thank you, Jesus. In first, uh, uh, first, I mean, 2 Timothy 3 and 12, he says, Yea, all that we live, let all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. Thank you, Jesus. So here's a nation. Here's a nation for whom God had provided everything necessary for them to be happy, to be healthy, and to be holy. And would have been the sweet smell of the Lord's goodness had turned into a disgusting odor in their noses and had a bad taste in their mouths. That for which they should have praised him for and resulted in him, they should have been praised. And what they didn't praise him for, they were turning their backs on him. They despised him for his grace, and they hated him for his generosity. They criticized him for his guidance. And this is what the lost world does every day, folks. The world, it breathes God's air, eats his food, and, and drinks his water, enjoys this world, despises God's word. That's what they do. They reject his authority and they refuse, they refuse to bow to his will. They shake their puny fist toward heaven and, and boast of their sin and voice their defiance of God. Every day in every way, the lost world proves that they are wicked, depraved sinners who deserve the judgment that God sends their way. The sin of Israel Thank you, Jesus. The sin of Israel wasn't unique to Israel. It happens every day in our world. What makes their sin so bad is the fact that they knew God firsthand. They knew God firsthand. They were in a relationship with him 24-7 every day. They had his word, they had his presence, they had his promises, and had seen him fulfill these promises time and time again. Yet they turned on him and rejected him out of hand. 
That's a terrible tragedy. And it happened far too often in our world. But when it does, there will be always be a price to pay. Verse 6, it says, So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. We see the sentence that the Lord pronounced on them. Because of Israel's rebellion, God sent judgment upon them in the form of fiery serpents. These serpents were deserved. The serpent, as you know, is a symbol of sin. Satan disguised himself as a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Throughout the Bible, the serpent is a symbol of sin and evil and rebellion against God. It's fitting that the Lord should send serpents among the people. Sin is like a serpent. Sin holds a tremendous power over us. It is always there in the depths of our fallen natures, waiting for it like a cobra to strike us and fill us with this deadly poison. If sin is allowed to sink its fangs into our lives, it will coil itself around us until it has choked the life right out of us. It will not stop until it has destroyed you and everything you love. And then the serpents, they were horrible. They are called fiery serpents. I believe they were called fiery because of the intense pain that they could inflict on their victims. These were most likely a type of viper found in the Middle East. The bite of these vipers is said to be immensely painful. Now, I was looking at some research on these vipers, and it, re it reveals the following symptoms of these vipers. The bite. It says the injection of the venom it, it, it initiates a fiery pain at the site of the bite. Swelling begins right away. Discoloration at the site of the bite varies from white uh, to flaming red, purples, and dark blues. Victims would experience nausea, vomiting, extruding, excruciating stomach pains, and cramping. Victims begin to experience extreme thirst. The liver and kidneys are damaged from filtering toxins, resulting in extreme tenderness in the lower abdominal area, and many times diarrhea sets in. Hemorrhaging occurs in the form of nosebleeds or, or bleeding from the mouth or the eyes. The viper's venom or poison is a hemotoxin. It destroys the blood cells and causing bleeding where capillaries are close to the surface. A person usually bleeds to death eternally. Quick deaths from a viper's bite are unusual. Generally, the suffering is prolonged for one or two days. So, so what is the point here? The point is God is trying to teach us here that suffering follows sin just as surely as night follows day. The devil has tried to sell us on the idol that it's hard to be a Christian. Well, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I can't hear you. Y'all believe that? Amen. Friends, it's not the way of the Christian that is hard. Proverbs 13 and 15 tells us the way of the transgressor is hard. As hard as it is to say, there is going to be some penalties from sin. Even, get this now. Thank you, Lord even for the saints of God who wander off into sin's playground. Yeah. And we see also that the serpents were deadly. We are told that many people of Israel died. But that's just like sin. Sin thrills, then sin kills. The Bible says the soul who sins shall die. It also says in James 1, 14 through 15, it says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Thank you, Jesus. And for the... Thank you, Lord. Romans 6 and 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. The same serpent 
that inflicts death is the same serpent that will tell you that God does not punish sin. But there is still a fiery, fatal, fearful, and, uh, fearful and dreadful punishment for those who die in their sin. Now, someone may say this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're talking about hell. Isn't it interesting that while that the vast majority of, uh, majority of people no longer believe in hell and they get upset when a preacher preaches about hell. But almost everybody talks about hell and uses it as a byword. Oh, you've heard it. You've heard it. Now I want to make this matter as easy to understand as possible, folks. The Bible says that sin is a debt. And when a person has a debt, either the debt is paid or the debtor is punished. Either your sin is, has been paid for by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, or your sin debt will be punished in the fire of hell. Defiant sinners always face the judgment of deadly serpents. And there is a real place called hell, folks. And all those who reject Jesus Christ will spend eternity there. Listen again in verse 6. It says, many of the people of Israel died. Now that's putting it mildly. People are dropping like flies. They're dying all over the camp of Israel. Keep in mind that we're talking about two to four million people in a 12 square mile in an area like that. Poisonous serpents are biting them and coming from everywhere and they're getting sick and dying. Can you imagine all these serpents, all these snakes just appearing and biting people? There was no hospital. And even if there had been, it wouldn't have been big enough to treat all those who were sick. There are no doctors, and even if there were, there wouldn't be enough for all the patients. There's no anti-venom, venom, and no other medicines, and even if there were, there wouldn't be enough to go around. This is a desperate situation. People are dying everywhere, and there seem to be no cure available, and there's no help in sight. And see, what a tragic picture this is. What a tragic picture this paints of the lost sinner in their fallen conditions. Left to themselves, the lost sinner is in a hopeless, helpless condition. They cannot change their situation. They cannot save themselves from the poison of sin that flows through their veins. And that is why I rejoice in the tremendous thought that presents itself in this passage. Here it is. Even though a situation may be desperate with God, it is never hopeless. Let me say that again. With God, it is never hopeless. Let me read verse 7. It says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And we see that we see Israel's sorrow here. When you've been bitten by a deadly snake, there are only two things you can do. You can sit and die or you can get up and do something about it. The Israelites chose to do something about the situation. And they took three steps that every person has to take if he or she is going to be cured of the snake bite of sin and escape the fiery judgment of hell. First, there was conviction. Yes. Yes. Therefore, the people of, came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Amen. No matter what else you do, until you get to that point in your life where you are willing to say, I have sinned, you will never be saved. That is what Jesus meant when he said, no one, thank you, Jesus, in John 6 and 44, thank you, Jesus. He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then there was confession. 
The people went on to say, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Amen. True conviction is always followed by full confession. In fact, confession not only follows conviction, but conviction really forces confession. The sinner must get honest about his or her condition and before they have to get I want to put this in the right way so you can see it this here. They must get honest about his or her condition before there can be salvation. Admit you have a wrong and you've sinned. And then there was remorse, this third step. The people went on to say, pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us so Moses prayed for the people. The final step is when you realize that your only hope is God. Amen. 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 When the sinner comes to see their lost conditions and confesses that need before the Lord, the sinner will be at a place where he will turn to the Lord for the help he or she needs. So here are the three steps that always work together. In conviction, you are now acknowledge you have done the wrong to yourself. In confession, you always admit that you have done wrong to others. In remorse, you accept that you have done wrong before God. Then and only then, hallelujah, then and only then is the Lord ready to accomplish his work of salvation in a lost soul. Listen. Every single one of the steps I have mentioned here is, is a work of God's grace within the sinner's heart. The sinner cannot convict himself. The sinner cannot draw himself. The sinner cannot even see their own need until God reveals it to them because they are dead in trespasses and sins. It is God who makes the sinner aware of the lost sinful condition. It is God who convinces the sinner of their sin. It is God who draws the sinner to Jesus Christ, folks. And it is God who gives the sinner the faith to believe in the gospel. It is God who saves the soul. It is God who saves the soul. So put it simply, from beginning to end, salvation is of the Lord. And then in verses 8 and 9, let me read those. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a, on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he look at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if the serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. We see Israel's salvation here. Incredibly, the cure for this serpent problem is not a pill or a potion. The solution is a brass serpent raised up on a pole. There are some precious truths I want you to see here about this brass serpent. There is a picture of guilt here. The serpent symbolizes sin. Brass in the Bible is a symbol of judgment. Being lifted up on a pole pictures a curse. For the Bible says, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's in Galatians chapter 3. Now, do you see anything strange here? The care for the serpent, the serpent problem, took the form of what caused the problem in the, to begin with. It was a serpent that bit them. But it was a serpent that healed them. When Jesus went to the cross, he died to pay for our sins. Jesus had no sin of his own, and he was innocent of all sin. But he took our sins on himself and died for us. Amen. I want you to get that. The innocent for the guilty. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 21 says, Thank you, Lord. For he hath made him who knew no sin be sin for us. That's right. yeah. Yeah. 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then there's the provision of God. Who came up with the plan like this in the first place? Verse 8 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, The plan of salvation is the Lord's idea. And the Lord's idea about salvation has never changed. The way people were saved here in the Old Testament is exactly the way people are saved in the New Testament. And it's the way people are still saved today. In Numbers 21, looking to a substitute provided by God saved them. Looking to a Savior, uh, uh, Jesus Christ provided God who saved us. And the only difference is in Numbers 21, we see a picture of the Lord Jesus. But in the New Testament, we see him. We see him. And there's power in the grace of grace here. I want you to see something about this wonderful salvation. First of all, it was infallible. Everyone who looks, who looked, lived. They didn't just feel better. They got well. In the Old Testament, the Bible says, look and live. Do you get that? It says, in the Bible, Old Testament it says, look and live. In the New Testament, the Bible says, believe and be saved. Looking, at, look, looking, is, to, looking is to the eye what faith is to the heart. If you look at that serpent, you are guaranteed to live. If you believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's in Romans. Yeah. And it was individual. Listen, it was individual here. Everyone had to look for themselves. I could not look for you. Everyone had to look for themselves. Whether you're a child, boy, or girl, man, or woman, you have to look for yourselves. No one can look for another person. If you were bitten and wanted to be healed, you had to look for yourself. Anybody could be healed, but not everyone was healed because not everyone looked. And it was instantaneous. The people who looked at that serpent did not have to wait. They didn't have to pray. They didn't have to pay for this salvation. The moment you looked at, the moment you looked at this serpent, the minute you looked, salvation took its process. Listen, salvation is not a process. Salvation is a moment of crisis when you come to see yourself exactly as you are. When you come to see Jesus Christ exactly as he is. When you are brought face to face with Jesus Christ and you look to him with the eyes of faith, trusting him for salvation, at that moment he saves you by the power of his grace. And it was invaluable, the salvation. The healing God provided through that serpent was free, readily available. It was sufficient. It could work for anyone. And thus it is with Jesus Christ. You can be saved if you want to be. Revelations 22 and, 20 and 22 and 17 says, And the spirit of the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirst come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. Now, there are some lessons we need to glean from this passage about our relationship with the Lord Jesus. And how are we to be saved and what we ought to do after we're saved? First, we must look to Jesus for salvation. Think about it. The only condition placed on these people was simply to look. The Israelites could have tried all kinds of homemade remedies. They could have bathed their wounds with tears of remorse. Put on the ointment of religion. They could have 
bandage themselves with good works. And you know what would have happened? Still, those snake bites of sin would have killed them. I want you to listen to me well here. If you're watching and listening, if you're watching and listening, if you're in the house, listen to me well. The people who died did not die just because they had been bitten. Ultimately, they died because they would not look. Take a moment here to go back in your mind to that day and try to imagine the scene here. Here's a man or a person who had been wonderfully cured by looking at that serpent. He begins to go from tent to tent trying to get other people to look. One man says, oh, I'm too sick. I'm too far gone. Not even that raised serpent could heal me. Another one uh, uh, said, well, I don't feel like this snake bite is all that bad. Matter of fact, I haven't been bitten as bad as some people. I'm only bitten once. Another one might have said, well, when I get well, I'll look. I'm just not going to look till I get that healing feeling. But I tell you, when I get my life straightened out and get over this snake bite, then I'll look. Another one may say, oh, I don't believe that brass serpent theory. I don't buy into that. I don't see a relationship or a connection between the serpent raised up on a pole and this snake bite that's killing me. I'm not interested. It's just a bunch of hogwash. Another person say, you know, I've really kind of gotten attached to the snake, or at least he's gotten attached to me. I kind of hate to give it up. I kind of enjoy it. I, if I look at that serpent, I'll have to give up this snake and believe I'll just hold on to it and what I've got and what I've got is what I need. Now, that may sound a little unusual and ridiculous to you, but the world is full of people that give these same kind of excuses day after day as to why they will not look to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. These will be people who will die in their sins and go to hell because they refuse to look to Jesus for salvation. John 8 and 24 says, Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John 3 and 36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall see, not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So what, 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 what must we do here? We must lift up Jesus. To prove my point to you that I made earlier about the relationship between the Old and the New Testaments, listen to what Jesus himself said about this story. In John chapter 3, 14 through 15, he says this. As Moses, and this is Jesus, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross to pay for our sins, and if he's the only hope we have of salvation, don't you agree with me that we ought to be lifting up Jesus so that others might hear about him and be saved? Now, let your imagination wander back with me just one more time. Can you imagine, can you hear the sobbing and wailing of all the people all over the camp? Imagine that. Every family been affected by the bites of those poisonous snakes. Eyes are red with weeping. Cheeks are bleached with fear. Lotions and potions have been applied. Herbs have been compounded. Medicines have been drunk. For the people are dying by the hundreds and thousands and still the people... Young people, old, young, are perishing. Everywhere you look, there are funerals and burials. Then all of a sudden, a shout 
cuts through the air like a knife going through butter. A cure, a cure, a cure. We have a cure. People who have been bitten, people who are dying are now running in and out from the tent and saying, look and live. Look and live, look and live. And soon by the hundreds and then by the thousands, fevered, pain, wreck, expiring snake victims are evacuated from their tents to places where they can simply look and see that brass snake on that high pole. And everywhere instantaneously, people are cured and people are saved. And in one tent, a mother is bending over the weak, feverish form of her dying son. She has buried his father. And now she knows she's about to bury him. And all of a sudden, a neighbor comes and says, your son does not have to die. There's a cure. The mother said, what do I need to do? She says, pick him up and bring him out. Get him to look at that brass serpent on the pole. The mother brings him out of the tent and she says, look, there it is. She lifts up the head of that little boy. She pries open just one of his eyes and says, son, look. That little boy looks and does he see it? Yes, he sees it. The color comes back into his cheeks. The fever leaves his sweating forehead. His headache stops. His limbs straighten out. His eyes open. He sits up and stands up. He leaps. He shouts. He dances because he's been totally and wonderfully healed. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. If it has happened to you, you want, to, want it to happen to others. It's just natural when you look to Jesus, you want to lift up Jesus. As I end here, who is glad to have the salvation of the Lord in your life today? Hallelujah. Someone say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And as I end today, If you're watching and listening, I'm going to give you this out of my heart. Where does Simon find you today? Have you been bitten by the serpent of sin? Have you, can you, can you feel this poison working through your system? Are you aware of the pain and the problem sin can cause you? Are you conscious of the fact that you're going to die and when you do, you're going to hell? Does that describe you? If it does, let me tell you that you do not have to die without Jesus. You don't have to live one more minute as a slave to sin and and his power. You do not have to go to hell. I'm here today. I'm here today to invite you to look and live. To look and live to look and live look to Jesus and be free and it's as simple as that one look saved Israel and one look will save you and if you're saved today let me say this if you're saved today are you lifting him up to those around you are you pulling them out of the fire. Has the great commission in Matthew 28, 19 to 20 become the great omission? Do you need to ask the Lord to forgive you for not telling the lost about Christ? Do you need to pray for lost souls today? If you're saved, how long has it been since you bowed at his feet? loved on him and thanked him for all he has done for you? How long has it been since you lifted your voice to testify of his saving grace? Let me ask you again, folks, who is glad to be saved in this house? 
Who is glad to have Jesus in your heart in this house? How long has it been since you've been overcome and overwhelmed by, this, by his power? His love, his grace, and his glory. Think about those questions and let's examine ourselves to pray to the Lord to make us better. And if you don't have Jesus in your heart and you're listening, again, all you have to do is just look and live. Our Father is here to give you life. And that's the life of salvation. He can make the difference in your life and he can take the venom and poison out of your uh, poison and venom and poison of sin out of your life. If you just look and live. He wants to guide us. He wants to guide you and protect your soul and, and put him under, your, under the shadow of his mighty wings. So why don't you make the greatest decision you can ever make in your life and that is to let him be the Lord and Savior of your life. If you're watching and listening, you've tried everything else. Now it's time to try Jesus. One thing I know, he won't let you down. If you just look and live. If you just look up to him. So why don't you meet him now? Because you don't want to meet him later. I was urgent and, 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 and compassionate about this sermon. Because we're not looking to him and living. That's the world's problems today. We can't look and live to Jesus, look up to him and, and receive his salvation. We, 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 we shouldn't reject him. And I'm sure there were some of those Israelites in that time, in that time, in that, in that incident of those vipers who, who, who rejected. He said, why should we look at a serpent? But then those who did not look all died. I'm pleading with you and asking you. Look to Jesus and live. So if you decide to give Jesus your life right now, I want you to pray this prayer with me and pray it earnestly and pray it sincerely with me. Folks in the church, I want you to, 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 to bow your heads with me. Say this with me, dear Jesus. I need you in my life. I'm sorry for my sins. I know I've rejected you, Lord. I've tried everything else. And I thank you for this moment in time that you've given me to redeem myself, to ask you, Father, to come into my heart, to come into my mind, to come into my soul, and make my life clean. Save me, Lord. I need you. I want you in my life. I can't live without you. I need you to be my salvation. Thank you, Father. Forgive me of my sins and my shame. Give me a new walk, Lord, and a new talk. Take away the old things and make my life new. And I thank you, Father. And I know right now, Lord, if I look and live, if I look to you and live, Lord, you will sustain me for the rest of my life. I'm looking to you, Lord, and I'm living right now. You've given me new life, and I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I know right now you died on the cross, and you rose again on the third day, and I believe you. I thank you. I thank you, Father, for saving me, and I believe I am saved. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Give God a hand. Praise, folks. Hallelujah.
I praise God for all of you being in the house.